if everybody were really scaling down, right? <laughs> it's the way we love, the way we care. Like then we'd have all these communities all over the world that were creating this collective energy that would shift things. Welcome to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel, a podcast that illuminates the path to collective healing at the intersection of science and mysticism. This is the Point of Relation. The following interview was recorded during a previous Collective Trauma Summit, an online gathering convened annually by Thomas Hubel to share ideas and inspire action for healing. V, formerly Eve Ensler, is a Tony Award-winning playwright and author of the theatrical phenomenon, The Vagina Monologues. She is the author of the books, including The Apology and In the Body of the World, as well as the New York Times bestseller, I Am an Emotional Creature. She helped create the play, That Kindness, Nurses in Their Own Words, presented by BAM. She is the founder of V-Day, a global activist movement that has raised over $120 million to end violence against all women, cisgender and transgender, those who hold fluid identities, non-binary people, girls, and the planet, and the founder of One Billion Rising, the largest global mass action to end gender-based violence in over 200 countries, as well as co-founder of City of Joy. She writes regularly for The Guardian. Before we begin, we wanted to let you know that this conversation includes the topic of sexual abuse. While it is not the primary topic, and it is addressed with care and sensitivity, we wanted to offer this content warning for listeners who may not want to engage with this subject. Welcome to the Collective Trauma Summit 2022. My name is Thomas Hubel, and I'm the convener of the summit and I have the real pleasure and honor uh, to welcome today V. V, warm welcome here to the Collective Trauma Summit. Thank you. Mm, it's so lovely. Just when you came on, like I felt like a, such a lovely radiance of your being and like how you came into the space is very lovely. And, and I know you have like a huge uh, path that you already walked and uh, you did so many things and there are so many things that I'm really interested in and what you did because it connects very much to what I'm deeply interested in. But maybe for our listeners, uh, you know, I, I look at life as there are deep significant experiences plus and or our calling that puts us on a track and forms our path to what we actually give to the world. And I'm curious what, what made you, you, and like, how did life compose itself around you so that you got on track to do all the amazing things that you're doing, which I really love, but how, how did it, where did it start or what were significant milestones on your way that you think formed your path? Such a good question. Um, you know, it's hard to know where 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 the beginning is of anything, right? Um, mm -hmm. you know, we have so many beginnings and um, and so many endings, actually. Um, but I think I think the most obvious, you know, um, things that happened in my life were coming from, you know, this family and this household that appeared had all the appearances of you know what the american dream you know is a kind of white pick we literally had a picket fence you know um this this you know affluence upper middle class you know entitlement privilege on one hand and then um the interior world to that was um a world of utter darkness violence um destruction you know trauma and I think this split, um, this this uh, non-alignment of, of of realities, really created who I am to a large degree. If I if I look at my life, you know the the what we're being told is the truth versus what we know is the truth, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that many many people struggle with. You know you know. 
being fed this American dream that is and living in poverty, being told this is the greatest country in the world, and and knowing that white supremacy reigns here, um, telling being you know fed these these notions that if you have money and you have things and if you have success, everything will be fine. When in fact, it, you know, it, it usually encourages just the opposite. So, I think I think growing up with a father who was not only the CEO of a company but the CEO of my family, you know, and who ruled like a corporate patriarch, and and you know had his way with my body, my mind, my heart. Um, you know, I just living in this tyranny of of violence and invasion and. And simultaneously, um, early on, knowing that the only way I would survive was to resist and rebel and find a form that I could save my sanity. And, and writing became that way. It became the way I was going to, I wrote my way into existence, essentially, or I wrote my way into sanity or, or a form of sanity that at least kept me functioning in the world. So I think that that event of my father, that event of that violence was, you know, absolutely creational in 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 who I am. And and that was a big section of my like, you know, from five to to six till when I left home at 16, you know. But I think there's been other really seminal events. I mean, um, you know, interviewing the woman who was going through menopause and told me about her vagina. Um, and talking to her about, you know, her vagina being dried up and prune-like and dead and finished um, and being shocked because she was a feminist and I couldn't believe what she was saying led me to start talking to other women about their vaginas, which led to, you know, this unbelievable phenomena um, experience that when it is still going on, you know, many, many, many years later. Um, so that was just an amazing journey. I think almost dying 14 years ago of stage three slash four cancer um, and discovering that I had a tumor in me the size of a mango and going through that process of, wow, almost dying, you know, coming right up to it. Um, and then literally like, you know, having whatever of my past, whatever of my story, melted away so that the next stage of my life literally opened up and I left the city and I moved to the woods and I lived there. So that was a pretty amazing moment, mm -hmm. you know. Wow, it's very intense. <laughs> you just have a very intense. Going to Bosnia the first time and being um, with women who had just been returned from rape camps and sitting and listening to their stories was also a seminal moment when I suddenly realized that violence against, against women and all women might be, in fact, the central issue of our of our world. And that opened up a whole new idea of what I was going to commit my life to. You know, what was going to be, in some ways, the mission of my life. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. when you when you interviewed these women and you came in contact with what I would call this massive collective trauma field, like which is like global. Like how can you can you speak a little bit about what are the main things that you learned about it as you exposed yourself to it? And also what was the power in you that um prevented you from burning out? Because we see that many people that deal with that amount of trauma and hear so much trauma, like suffer themselves and they often can't do this work for a long time because, you know, the resourcing doesn't work. And obviously that's not what happened to you. So I think I think my first trip to Bosnia and spending time at the Center for Women War Victims, which was a center that had been organized by Croatian and Serbian and Bosnian women so that they were all treating each other and not separating each other out because they were women. Um, and I spent months living on their couch and just spending time in refugee camps and listening to stories. I felt like I entered what you're talking about, this collective realm of trauma towards women, which has been here historically, continues on today. And I think 
what I realized is it's right in front of us and nobody wants to address it. It's the thing that's most determining people's existence that nobody wants to heal. It's, it's, it's used, you know, this idea that we have a, a systematic tactic of war, which is basically the devastation and the rape and the annihilation of women's bodies as, as a tool of war. And that it, it it continues on and it's legitimized and it's 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 not seen as something horrific. And you know, um, and actually I think in, in recent years it's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse to some degrees. The more the more mechanized war becomes, the more distant war becomes, you know, the, the more um um it's it's just become horrifyingly normalized, you know. And I think I felt like I was entering some story, you know, both ancient and contemporary, that was somehow, um, it, it, I felt pulled in in a way where I knew it was going to take my life. Like, do you know, I knew it was going to, not literally my life, but it was going to take my, all my central o- occupation of thought, of action, of and um, and also because I'm a survivor, so I resonated so deeply with the stories, and I knew the implications and the impact of those stories, and I knew the long-term effects of those stories, and and so um, you know I f- I felt like I was with in a sisterhood of survivors that turned out to be you know one billion strong, right? Um, mm-hmm. At least a billion women, and that's most of us. And if we haven't, we've witnessed it or know about it, so it's operating as a, a method of suppressing us and 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 keeping us in our place and I, and I think um it was an it, it was like a shocking experience it was devastating and yet it was something I was completely familiar with right mm-hmm. of course that began this journey which led me to many war zones and many refugee centers and me- many, homeless shelters and prisons and detention camps and you know where i've spent a great deal of my life listening to the stories of women right um burnout's a very interesting question because um if you're not very careful um and you don't create protective devices you know my body is very very absorbent and porous i didn't build i wasn't able to build essential protecting protection mechanisms because of trauma because people got in way too early and they tore down those veils and they tore, tore down the boundaries. Um, you know, a lot got in, a lot got in and a lot got in and began to, you know, it wasn't in t- 14 years ago, that tumor, um, you know, I had an image one night where I closed my eyes and I pictured it and it was just like a, a bar, a, a, a ball of yarn and each, each, each little string was a story that someone had it had just wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped. And actually when they removed that tumor, I feel like they removed those stories to a large degree. You know, they they took them out of me. And now I'm very, very careful. I don't listen to as many stories as I used to. I I have to really be very wary of this body because it's already lost a lot of organs and a lot of nodes. And and I would say for people who were working in the field, that body work is critical if you are on the front lines of ingesting, hearing, absorbing stories, because if you are, are, are at all an empathetic person, which you have to be to do this work, your empathy will invite those stories into your body. And what you have to be working with is some kind of healer or some kind of person who helps you release that through sound, through movement, through body work done so that you can constantly be getting it out of your body if you're doing this work. Right. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that's why I'm, I was asking you because I know you were so exposed, and so I was wondering how that affected you. Or how so? That's and I think your message is very true. I would underline that very much that we need to really take care of of ourselves. Also, we can reinfect people with how we've been infected, huh. as it begins to change us and make us bitter, or make us angry, or make us resentful. You know. And so our work is to keep ourselves clean, 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 clean all the way in our spirits and and our bodies, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
I, I find it amazing, like just uh, reading your kind of biography and, and, and getting to know how much you actually engaged because I deeply honor this, this kind of work because it's very dear to my heart. But I, when I saw the richness of how much you gave in your life, it's, I deeply honor that part in you. It touches me very much, uh, listening to you and feeling that in you. And also, of course, how you spoke now about the boundaries, that's equally important. And there is something like the city of joy, like you, you went to Bosnia, but you also went to Congo, which is also a very traumatizing and traumatized environment. But actually you managed to set up an amazing project. Maybe you can speak a little about that too for us. Congo is a really incredible place. It's, it's so many things, you know, it's a place that's been horrifically colonized, horrifically invaded, extracted, raped, plundered, consumed, and still the, the Congolese are some of the most powerful, beautiful, um, extraordinary people I've ever met. And I think, um, you know, I had been to a lot of war zones by the time I got to Congo. I'd been in Bosnia, I'd been in Kosovo, I'd been in Haiti, I'd been in Afghanistan, um, but nothing really quite compared with what was happening to women in Congo because, because it's an economic war and because there's so many multinational corporations who are players in this war, and using these proxy militias to secure the bounty of coltane and copper and gold and and now what's going into electric cars, right? Um, this war was literally being waged on the bodies of women, hundreds of thousands of women, and it's been going on for you know you know. In, in, in King Leopold's time, what, 10 million people died under King Leopold. But over the last 14 years, we know that it's probably comparable numbers of people who've died in the Congo, right? And yet, it, again, it's right in front of us. It's all happening in broad daylight. And yet there's been, in my opinion, a completely inept and and, and unparalleled, you know, like it, 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 the response to it doesn't even come close to what the situation is. So so for me, meeting women there and um, and spending time and with Dr. McGuege, who is an incredible human being who won the Nobel Peace Prize a few years ago for his work with women in the Congo and the incredible work he was doing of sewing up women's bodies and vaginas literally as fast as the militias were ripping them apart. He and I and Christine Schuller, describer, who is an extraordinary leader and activist, we teamed up and we just spend time listening to women and asking them, like, what do you need? What do you want? What what can we do that, that comes from you? And the thing they all said over and over is build us a place where we can be, be safe and we can transform and we can change our existence. And so we came up with this idea of City of Joy. And it, it's a sanctuary. It's a revolutionary center. Um, 90 women are there for six months at a time. Everything is paid. They have collective, amazing therapy, which they only do in groups. So there's no individual therapy because the theory, you know, first of all, there would never be individual therapy in, in the Congo because that's not how it's structured. It's all community-based. But also the, the, our theory is that when one woman heals, everybody heals. And when we're healing together and we're transforming together, then we're all rising at the same time. And it's amazing. Like, I have to say, it's the holiest place I've ever been in my life. And I've been to some pretty, I was just at Chartres for a week doing workshops on apology. And I have to tell you, the City of Joy is the holiest place I've ever been because what is happening there is is completely run by the Congolese, completely determined by them. There's no international people who work there. I think it's the only project that's true of in the Congo. Um, everybody has learned how to do what they're doing on the job and they learned it out of love. And they've learned it out of care for their sisters. Um, and everything that is generated by love, I mean, love is the opposite of trauma, right? Love, love is the antidote to trauma. Love, love is the only thing that can heal trauma, in my opinion. And so it's a place that is, is, is it's, it's, a, it's love emergent. It's, it's, it's everywhere you go, there is dancing and there is singing and there is care and there is people massaging each other and people taking care of each other and people lifting each other up and people, I mean, all of the women who work there and the men are just completely committed with their lives to 
the healing and to, you know, we, we go from um, victim to survivor to leader. And the whole idea is that women leave City of Joy leaders and they go back to their communities and they transform their communities and they do, and it's happening and it's real, you know? Um, and we have an amazing farm, a V World farm, where um, many of our women graduate and they go there and they learn permaculture and they learn how to be really good farmers. And um, they bring all those tools back to their communities. And there are so many things to me about City of Joy that are the model of the new world. Like it's a place run by principles and they're amazing principles, um, you know, some of which are like, tell the truth, um, treat your sister's life as if it were your own, um, don't stop waiting to be rescued, take initiative, know your rights, raise your voice, share what you've learned, give what you want the most. You were saying to me about giving, like, how did I heal? Like, we heal ourselves when we give what we want the most, right? Mm -hmm. Use it as fuel for a revolution, practice kindness, you know? And 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 those are, are the guiding principles of our world. And so, you know, they are transmitted through song, they're transmitted through poetry, and people live by those rules. And so once you have a community that is founded on principles of love and respect and kindness and um, miraculous things begin to happen, things you could never even imagine. A, a woman comes who's who's completely broken, who has never seen a bathroom, who has, you know, it, it seems psychotic on the outside. And literally within three months, that woman is helping and serving and taking care of her sisters. And you watch this because love is that powerful when it is allowed to be released in its pure form without without kind of neoliberal or without um, corruption, without corruption, you know? And so um, I have to say, I, I, I learn everything so much from City of Joy and from what's going on there. And and how I was just there for a few weeks in June, and I, I leave there every time feeling like, okay, here is this little lotus, this lotus in the in the mud, in the middle of dire poverty, war, violence, and it's rising, and it's now beginning to plant seeds, lotus blossom seeds everywhere around it. So the communities are changing, and people are having, and and you just see how one place can begin to be this radical, revolutionary, transformative hub for a new world if if all the ingredients are in alignment. No, 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 no. I think you, you said something that I want to underline, like a deep truth that I hear from, from your words about the city of joy is when you really take care of building one such an island, but with the right principles and you really manifest it, then it naturally organically starts to spread out. And if it's, and then it can grow organically, but it, it is not being put on steroids to, to become, I don't know, expanded, but it, it naturally does that anyway, because that's how life works. Scaling up. And I hate that expression, scaling up feels like, what does that even mean, scaling up? That's some capitalist, you know, growth term. You know, I I feel like when you're doing something truly and you're truly in it, the growth will occur, but it will match your ability to handle the growth. It is way past you. And so you're beginning to do something else that is no longer connected to you. You know, we mm -hmm. are beginning to get places around the world that are asking for city of joys. And we're beginning to see, you know, we said after 10 years, we'd have like a model. So we'd have principles and we'd understand things. And now we can begin to share those and see if there are other places that might be able to create these very same ingredients. But it's, 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 you have to be very, very, very careful because without taking your time and without nourishing and without the right leadership, like Christine Schuller-Descraver is an amazing leader. And she is devoted. She does not have a secret agenda. She doesn't want to be famous. She doesn't want to be rich. She she wants the women of her country to rise. And that is what is informing her work and therefore informing just about everybody who works there. And if people come who are not in that alignment, they leave because it, it never works, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. I think you also speak to one of the the big capitalist toxins in our world who 
blow everything and make everything big and uh, through steroids in a way. Steroids and painkillers are kind of the, the, the currency of our world partly. And I think that what I hear from you is a very connected organic growth that is also connected to nature, like to how nature works. And this feels very healthy to me. And I would say so much of the of joy is connected to nature. I mean, like not only, you know, it's so funny when we, we started, it, it, we built this in a swamp because that was the land we could get. And it's amazing what has grown in this swamp. I mean, it's gone from, it, it's it's a forest now where we are. You know, I, I went back to Chicago. I haven't been able to go since COVID. I was like, oh my God. But then we have this farm, which is, is 350 hectares. It's tilapia ponds and pigs and cows and avocado trees and tons of rice and 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 honey hives and 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 it's all so beautiful and all the people who work there are in love with it and you know there's a whole field and a whole plot of land which was given to the community so they would feel part of us so they work with us and they feel in sync with us and just our methods of work i think have what in people have made people feel and I, I was just there where all the workers on the farm were just standing up doing testimonies about how li- their lives have changed and you know and and so this is what we want we want to create communities of and if everybody were out creating these communities and not worrying about scaling up right if everybody were really scaling down right <laughs> the way we love, the way we care, like then we'd have all these communities all over the world that were creating this collective energy that would shift things, you know, and figuring out how to pay heed to the details, Mm -hmm. big projects that are, are, aren't connected to the people are connected. I don't think they ever work. I, I completely agree with you. And also like it shows itself the the connection to nature because I believe healing, as you said, goes through our body. Trauma can only be healed through our body and through our body, it's also healing nature. So it makes us naturally connected to nature and the biosphere and, you know, that the whole ecosystem, we are not separate particles on the planet, we are part of the planet. So one thing you said already that's very strong, it's like love is the, is kind of the remedy for trauma. Are there other like principles that you extracted? I mean, you spoke to some, but maybe we can summarize them a little bit for us. So what what are other principles you you learn? Because one thing that I also heard is, and that I deeply believe in, that collective healing is amazingly powerful. And you also spoke about the group and we are healing together. So are there more principles besides collective healing and, uh, and love as a remedy that you, you learn throughout the process? It's like it's like really beautiful parents who bring up their children, their boys to be feminist, and then they're appalled when they see what happens when they go to school. You know, like culture, as Sarah McKenna said, you know, the culture is not our friend, um, and you can't trust the culture. The culture is the thing that is poisoning you over and over and over again until you change the culture. And I think part of what I've really learned at City of Joy is that when the culture changes, and when the culture is clean, and when the culture is caring, and when the culture is loving people get healed. You can change the culture. So it goes, it's back and forth. You know what I mean? And I, I think this notion that you can somehow heal yourself outside is a very capitalist notion, very individualistic and completely untrue, to be honest with you. It's why people are always falling back into addiction or falling back into like, you know, we all have to do this together or this isn't going to happen. Um, we've touched on nature. I think nature is a huge piece of healing. Mm-hmm. I, I know for me, it's been probably one of the biggest pieces of it. I think art is what a huge, I think creating art, being witness to art, dancing, 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 being in the presence of poetry, being in the presence of, of theater, being in the presence of art, and creating art and making art. Because I think it takes you and it transports you out of the binaries, out of of the right and wrongs, left and right. It it brings you into that glorious place of ambiguity and wonder and mystery Mm -hmm. where my bliss is, you know, not knowing and being okay with not knowing. Um, I think another big piece is telling the truth about your story. I, I don't think you can really emerge out of trauma without going back and 
retelling, knowing, processing your trauma and, and getting to the heart of it and going through that kind of wound, which is the portal to the other side, you know? Um, and I think, I think the biggest for me of all the things that have healed me, loving and caring for people who are suffering has been the major way that I've healed, you know, just seeing that I can be useful, seeing that I can be in service. Mm -hmm maybe something I do makes it a little bit or better for somebody else. I mean, that gives me meaning, that gives me a sense of purpose, that gives me a sense that, you know, because so, so much of what trauma does is it robs you of a meaning and it robs you of your your sense of worth and it robs you of, of um, you know, it just levels you. And I think when you can see yourself in action as a person who is loving and caring and showing up for people, um, you feel you begin to feel good about yourself, you know. Yeah, that was a, a lot of concentrated wisdom within a few minutes. That's so lovely. I mean, I resonate with everything you said. I think these are so essential principles. Every one of them. This is really great. And I, and I deeply underline also that I think that we heal together, and only when the distortions of our cultures heal. Because sometimes we see our disease as a as a as a disturbance but actually what is if it's an expression of a system that is out of alignment and how to come back into alignment is a collective is a collective uh, effort and and i think that's also what gabor mate or another speaker speaks about about the myth of the normal or how can you be healthy in an unhealthy culture and and you spoke to this as well so i think that's very powerful and also collective Felix, I see this all the time in the groups, like when somebody has a healing process and hundreds of people or thousands of people witness that, that has an, a tremendous power. And, and I think I think that's one of the great things at City of Joy when you see women going through something in the group and, and then all these women are watching it and then suddenly they're like, oh, wow, that's my experience. I can do that. Exactly, exactly. And... Um, but naturally, also V Day, like you, many things that you started naturally started to grow, obviously, within these principles that you discovered. There, it seems like there is a fertilizer. Maybe you speak a little bit about like how you, through your own work, I mean, you said some things already, but the V Day, I think, is also a way to. Um, deal with the current violence against women in the world. And uh, maybe you can speak a bit to that too. Well, again, you know, I, I had no idea when we started VD, it's going to be 25 years this year, which is, help, how did this happen? <laughs> I think one of the things, um, when we started, it was really just, I had this play and so many women were coming up to me at the end of the show. And at first I thought, oh, great. They're going to tell me about their fabulous orgasms and their great sex lives. And, and in fact, they were coming up to tell me how they'd been beaten or raped or cut or incested. And it, it became overwhelming. I was going to stop doing the show because it was just too much. And I said, either I'm going to stop doing the show or we're going to use this play to end violence against women. Like, how can we do that? And I got a group of women together in my living room, which I think is where all revolutions begin and like what can we do and we came up with this idea of v-day and we were going to do one day where we put on the show and got all these great actors to perform it and raise money for local groups that were working to stop brain and battery and 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 we did one amazing performance and it was just mind-blowing you know 2500 people showed up and all these great actors performed it and we raised a lot of money and we it, it just opened up this it opened up it opened up this door that was begging to be to, be to be opened and you know one woman said i'm going to bring it to colleges and another woman said i'm going to make vagina pajamas and another woman said i'm going to make vagina puppets and another and it was like i'm going to bring this to pakistan and i'm going to bring this here and you know again it happened very organically it wasn't to do anything it was like everybody got a hold of this i always feel like there's this like this big amazing vagina tit in the sky and everybody was just pulling it down going i'm gonna do this and 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 you know it, and and i'm all for like take it and run take it and run go I'm, i i have a very anarchic sense of the world in me you know i don't i love it that people want to just take something and go with it so you know 
here we are 25 years later and it's pretty amazing what's happened in this 25 years. Have we ended violence against women and girls and non-binary people and trans women? No, we have not yet. But when we started this 25 years ago, you could not say the word vagina anywhere. And you can say the word vagina everywhere now. You could not talk about violence against women. It's a front page issue now, right? Mm -hmm. We've made huge legislative slides. We've birthed gorgeous projects like the City of Joy or the Safe House in Kenya. We've grown a movement, a global movement in 100 countries. Um, that's an, And we're still here, which is an achievement in itself. The ne negative side is if Dobbs and the reversal of abortion rights have shown us anything, we haven't dismantled the system, the mindset, the culture of patriarchy, right? And until we do, we're going to be f really fighting these individual battles forever, right? And we understand that all of these issues that oppress us have to be faced together. That that it, patriarchy to me has birth racism and it's birth capitalism and it's birth imperialism and it's birth all of these things, right? And until we begin to see that, you know, the inequality of wealth keeps women in unequal positions, you know, which is connected to racism because that inequality is more oppressive with people of color that, you know, it just goes, everything goes into everything else. You know what I mean? And I think, um, I don't know how we dismantle patriarchy. I, I have to tell you, I, I have pondered this probably every day of my life since I had a conscious mind. And um, I don't know the answer, but what I do know, and I think what's changing for me, um, I'm not going to react against it anymore. I feel there is something about, you know, my writing the apology, the book I wrote, um, where I wrote my father's apology to me and I climbed inside him for a year and I I really um, tried to understand, not justify, and I want to make that very clear, the difference, tried to understand what went into making my father, who was my father, that he could have done what he did to me. Like what were the ingredients that created his ability to harm me in such a profound way? And I think one of the reasons I did it is that I felt even at this time in my life, I was still in my father's narrative. I was still in my father's story. I was still reacting to my father, like, you know, a successful thing. You see proof you were wrong. You see, I'm always battling you. I'm always angry at you. I'm always proving. And I realized I don't want to be in that story anymore. I want to be in the story I create, right? Which is one of the reasons I changed my name. Like, I want this next period to be V's, V's story. I was in my father's story with his last name and his name. And that story's over. And, and I think part of what I don't want to be in anymore, it's time to create a vision and a place and a way of being that is new, inviting, exciting, inclusive, loving, inspiring, envisioning, a world without patriarchy, of cooperation and not dominance, of listening, of caring, inspiring, like including people, seeing people, cherishing people, having time for people, right? Where people are fed and housed and live in healthy neighborhoods and, you know, get health care and educated and, you know, um, and where we turn our our attention to caring for people and the earth and each other and doing everything we can to transform trauma into love, right? Like that means I can't spend all my time hating that, pushing against that, reacting against that. We have to build a new world over here. We have to, you know, whatever the whatever you say, the mother, she keeps doing her thing. Like no matter what happens in the world, spring comes. And no matter what happens in the world, the leaves fall at this time of year. She just goes on. And I'm learning from her. You need to create the world that's going to be so beautiful and so sexy and so alive and so enchanting that people want to come there and they don't want this world of the patriarch, which is so painful, so oppressive, so mean, so cruel, you know, um, and once you get a taste of what something else can be and a feel for it, then you're going to want, oh, I want that. You know, it's like sleep, sleeping on a scratchy blanket your whole life and then someone hands you cashmere and you're like, wait, there's cashmere? You know? <laughs> and I love it. I love it so much. And, and I love it also that you said, like, because 
like for many people, it might be that we stay in the story and the againstness to the story that we are a prisoner of. And also in a lot in the ancestral healing work, we say only when you find a relation to the past of your parents, you can make a different choice. You're not against it, but you're for something that you choose. And that's so beautiful. Everything you said is exactly that. It's like how you got this insight to choose something new. And I think that's also the answer to how to dismantle the patriarchal structures is not to fight it, but to actually create another world. And that's amazing. I think patriarchy is absolutely into itself, but I, I see this with One Billion Rising where people dance, right? And I'll tell you this great story, which is such an emblem of... So in Philippines, you know, they have a very revolutionary group called Gabriella, which is part of our movement, and there's workers involved. And the workers, um, for years, they were like, we march, we don't dance. And then one day they were, were like, maybe we do dance. And they started to, and they were like, okay, we love to dance. And anyway, they were dancing, protesting this corporation, and they were just dancing and dancing. And the police came, and they were so moved by the dancing, they just started dancing, right? Mm -hmm. To me, it's this the best story because it's like, what are we offering that is going to make people want to be part of this? Like, does it feel good? Do you feel seen? Do you feel loved? Do you feel nurtured? Do you feel like lifted up? Or do you feel judged? Do you feel put down? Do you feel like you're not good enough? Do you feel like you're doing something wrong, that you're stepping out of line? You know what I mean? Like, that's where people leave. Mm -hmm. That's been their traumatic experience. So how do we make people feel loved? How do we make people, as we're being fiercely committed to our political values? Very much so. And even more so because then you tap into your creative spark and you get the, the, the support of entire life is lining up behind you because you're choosing something new. And, uh, and that sounds to me really like the remedy. That's very powerful what you said. We were just in Croatia with all our, our One Billion Rising Council who, who determined what the theme and it is going to be for the year. We decided this year the theme was going to be Rising for Freedom, Create the New Culture. Mm -hmm. What does the new culture look like to you? What What is it? What What is the world we want to live in? We spend so much of our time resisting this culture as opposed to going, what is the culture we want to live in? And I think when we can begin to see that culture, we feel that culture, embody that culture, people get very drawn to us and and they want that. And um, that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing. I'm done mm. not fighting them. I'm done even. It's like, okay, we know what you do. We got it. We got it. Your end game is suicide. Your end game is to end this whole thing. That's where you're headed. You're going to kill our air, kill our food, kill our ground, kill our seas, kill us. So you have the power and, and, you know, I used to have this ongoing dream that there was a landscape of bombs and people just holding on to the bombs, starving, right? Mm -hmm. Because, like, that's what got created, like power, 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 and now there's nothing. It's over. So if you want power, if you want to dominate, if you want to get, we know that. We live in your world. I'm going to spend my time. I'm an artist. I'm going to build another world over yours. That's really lovely. And uh, so, I mean, you said it already, like in, uh, but maybe you want to speak more about, like, given all your experience and everything that you learned so far, what's the the most exciting? Maybe that's, that's already it, but is there more to your leading edge or does this sum up your current leading edge uh, where you feel your own calling, you know, where you feel your own calling at the moment that updates itself all the time? I think living here in the woods, I'm really connected to the mother. I'm really connected to her. Um, and I feel my edge is to serve her, to cherish her, to respect her, to praise her, to um, to be her daughter, to be her 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 servant, to be her to be her um, in any way I can. So, what my my leading edge is to listen. What am I to do? And and if I'm really if I'm really attentive, I'm I'm really still. I can hear what I'm meant to do. And right now I'm I'm creating a really exciting um, 
musical or this play fairy tale about climate change with music. And I'm having the best time in my life. I've you know never written, I'm writing with these two great composers and we're writing music and we're writing, the, and you know, I've written this fairy tale and it's going to be theatricalized. And you know what? It's got tons of teenagers in it. It's wild. It's called wild. It's, 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 it's isn't, I feel like, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a really funny story. Like we, we, we shifted what the play or the musical was going to be about from um it was it was going to be looking at extraction and 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 fracking and then we shifted it to deforestation and we we spent a week here working on it working on it working on it and it was an amazing experience and you know half the week we're thinking what does it sound like when a tree falls down and just trying to get the theatrics of like saws and anyway they left next day I hear this cracking, 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 cracking sound. And I run out and the catalpa tree has split in half and fallen in the pool. <laughs> Just fallen <laughs> in the pool. <laughs> and I feel like we're all getting those signs all the time. I get, I happen to get really huge, like you can't ignore them signs. But I, but I think we all are getting signs all the time if we want to tune in and pay attention to what's coming towards us, right? And so I think what I'm trying to do now in my life is how do I, in every way that I live, serve her, serve her, serve that which is life, serve that which is alive, serve that which feeds us, serve that which is so generously taking care of us at every moment and 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 be a good daughter and be a good daughter, you know? Um, and that feels like a lot. It feels like a lot. And it manifests itself in our political work and my artistic work and my personal work and in my life, you know, like, am, is this what she would want me to be? Is this, is this making... Is this is this furthering her life? That's very powerful. Very powerful. Beautiful. And um I have uh, maybe two two more questions for you. I know I don't want to stretch your time too much. Um one is like we my wife and I we set up an NGO some like 16, 2016, and it's collective trauma work around the world. But what I like one part of the vision is what is because I believe when we heal trauma enough and this like a, a natural uh, urge to apologize like an ethical correction is basically always when the ice melts there is like a realignment an ethical learning and I think we need in a lot of ice there's a lot of ethical learning that's frozen that's why we didn't get it so we need to de-ice it in order to grow as human beings to meet uh, AI and nanotechnology and many other things that are tech related or science related and since you wrote this book on apology I'm, I'm curious because I see in the in the moment we heal enough, like for example, states apologizing to each other, to groups of people, to suppressed ethnicities, to you know, to end slavery and racism. There's there's a, a natural apology that's arising from deep healing, and I'm wondering when you envision um, states where a lot of trauma happened or genocides happened or other crucial things happen. Like, how do we approach that kind of collective apology that it will be a natural consequence of us touching the deep humanity of who we are in order to come to that voice? Because you spoke about the voice of the mother and I believe the mother once that these wounds can heal. And yeah, maybe you can speak to what comes up in you when I say that. Wonderful question. I'm so happy you asked it. Um, I think I think writing the apology was such a profound thing because if you had ever told me that I was going to climb into my father and, and feel his pain, and you know, he was just a monster to me and that was done. Like, and to go back and to feel my father's pain and to understand what happened to my father was was excruciating, but it was the most liberatory thing I've ever done, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it allowed me to um, understand. First of all, understanding is freedom. It's freedom, right? 
Because by seeing who my father was, I came to understand that what he did had nothing to do with me. Like it had him. I was a child, right? Once the book came out into the world, people started to write me like, I want to know how to apologize or I feel like I want to do this or I want to do this. And and what I, I, I feel about collective apology, look, the, the, the non-apology is one of the central columns that keeps patriarchy in its place. Men have been told from the beginning of time, never apology, never apologize, never be weak, never show your vulnerability, never show you're wrong. That's how you, that's how you, you'll lose your way, right? It is the hardest thing for men to overcome. I really believe that because it's been so indoctrinated into them. So what are states but patriarchal constructs, right? They're just the larger amplification of a patriarchal mandate, right? So why would states ever apologize? I think when we get to the place where states and 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 systems that are responsible for enslaving people or genocides or robbing people of their lands. Like if we just look what happened to the indigenous in this country, like the stealing of lands, the killing of thousands and thousands of of indigenous people, the robbing of the, and 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 eviscerating of their traditions, torturing them in schools. Um, you know, beating out their wisdom, beating out their, you know, there is a, a massive apology and and reparations and reconciliation that must occur in this country if it is to ever truly go forward. There is no way to go forward without that. Same with what happened to African Americans who were brought here as slaves, who died in the millions who were tortured for years, who were enslaved, who were whipped, who were, and then all the things that followed from Jim Crow, whether, you know, mass incarceration, black people beginning to rise and being wiped out again during Jim Crow. Um, all of that has got to be dealt with in a way where collectively we acknowledge it, we speak it, we own it. We we see as white people, for example, that everything we have is predicated on it. And our privileges and our our whole story is linked to that because without that enslavement, without that oppression, we would never have achieved the material goods and the advancements that white people have. And until that's fully acknowledged and apologized for and reckoned with, there is no way this country. And so you see now in America this incredible beginning of reckoning, and then this incredible pushback against it, right? Uh, not wanting to teach anti-racism, eviscerating critical race theory, like all the ways in which we are pushing back against telling the real story and owning the real the real history of this country. And I think it's very dangerous. I mean, I have a line in my new, I have a new book called Reckoning that's coming out in January. And there's just one little line, which is reckoning is the antidote to fascism. It's like, if you reckon with things and if you remember things and if you tell the truth about things, then you won't, fascism is impossible. Pretend it hasn't happened, you're all almost inviting it to happen again. Mm -hmm. And I think, do I think it's possible? Of course it's possible with the right leadership, with with a person, look, 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 I mean, it was, it was an incomplete apology, but certainly in New Zealand, the beginnings of an attempt to apologize to the Aboriginal was there on the book, and that was something. And that needs to be a much deeper apology, and that needs to be going into much. In, and, and also, there need to be ramifications to that apology. There need to be reparations and, and reconciliations that go along with it. It's not just simply, I'm sorry, but here is what you are entitled to. I think when that mechanism collectively begins to start to happen, we will see the possibility of real change in the world, but it will not happen until that happens. It's impossible. Until people own what they've done to you and 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 say in some way, there is no way people can release those harms. You know, it's it's very vicious. On the other hand, I think we have to find modes that, that don't keep us caught in our grievances and caught forever. I mean, I sometimes think as a Jewish per person sometimes that we're we're caught so much in our grievance, right? That in this determination to be that grievance, that we allow ourselves to perpetuate terrible crimes against other people, i.e. the Palestinians in the name of that, rather than finding forms, right? That release us from those grievances, right? And, and what are those forms, right? So that we don't have to be only that, 
right? We can be more than our grievances. And I think, you know, that's that's something we all need to be thinking about. Like, how do we honor the history, the horrible things that have been done to us, and yet say that is done and we are made anew through, you know, through people owning it and 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 through people acknowledging it and through people apologizing for it and that we don't have to keep seeing that as the only thing that we are. And that's true across the board with everyone. You know, how do we do that? And it's hard when often the people who are most aggrieved are the most ignored. They, they continue to be the most depressed. Um, there is, as there is horrible racism, there is horrible anti-Semitism. It all continues. And yet, on some level, if we just keep continuing that, we keep continuing perpetuating the patterns of oppressed oppressor, oppressed oppressor. Um, we do to other people what was done to us, you know? Yeah, yeah very much so. It touches me deeply when you speak about it because I completely agree with what you said. Impulse to speak about it's not like a question, but it's more like I want to hear how you how you respond to this, given everything that you've seen. Um, because I believe that you know when somebody is missing in a community, the responsibility, the ability to respond to that of the community is to go to look for that person, you know, and 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 rescue or bring that person back if they can't come back by themselves, and and. And I believe on the level of trauma or pain, there is a level of pain where we still have a voice to call for help. But actually, the deepest pain in our culture is the one that is mute. And you spoke a little bit about it now at the end, there's so horrible racism, anti-Semitism, violence against women that the muteness is actually the deepest pain. But when we don't have a word, we don't have a creation, so we can't call for help. So a lot of the pain is a, like the deepest pain is actually mute. And it needs all of us, like like your service, like you're serving the world is a way to go to look for that missing mute pain that often can't call for help. And and when you hear me speak about that, I would love to to uh, hear your thoughts on that, how we as people who are so privileged to have enough awareness of the world that it's actually our job to go to look for that pain that is missing in the muteness. And maybe you can speak to that a bit. You know, it's interesting you're saying that because I think, you know, um, I think I've spent my life, I think because I felt so muted as a child and because there was no place to go with my pain except to write in my journals and whatever, um, I was so lonely. I'm so lonely. And I think one of the most prevailing things in the world right now is this utter capitalist loneliness. It just I, it just feels capitalism has just burst this horrible loneliness where people cannot speak their pain. They don't trust anyone to believe their pain. They don't um, believe people have time for their pain. Everyone's just rushing, rushing, rushing. And you know, one of the things I feel my life has been is like I've gone to places where people are invisible, where people don't exist. I've gone, I spent my life in homeless shelters and I spent my life in prison, in refugee camps. I, I've spent my life where, where the discarded live, where the with people who stop mattering to people live. And I've done that because I feel like until they're all included in part of us, we don't get to be whole. There, you know, we're all this this mandala, right? We're all this collective. Young talks about collective unconscious. We're all this, and every part of us has to be part of this alignment and this circle before we any one of us gets to be whole. So, I have to say, I have been so privileged to spend eight years in a maximum security prison with a group of women who were all there for violent crimes watching them every week wrestle with their crimes, but also with their histories, with their hearts, with their stories, to give voice to who they were and why they did, because none of those women had time in their life or a way in their life to even voice who they were, what they felt, because life just happened to them. It just happened to them. It was just like, it threw them against a wall and then they woke up one day in prison, right? And I spent time in homeless shelters where the same thing happened to people. And I spent time in refugee camps. And I think 
I think, honestly, what we all need to do is look around at the people sitting next to us on the bus, at the people walking by us, at the person serving us coffee, at the person, who are those people? What pain are they in? What suffering are they in? What's their story? Who cares about them? And, and and even if it's just making an effort once a day to listen to somebody, to feel somebody, to be in relationship with somebody that you would normally not pay attention to, it changes people's lives overnight to feel like someone cares about your story and wants to hear what's going on with you and is interested in you. And, and I think we have become so atomized particularly since COVID, we're all cut off, locked up, shut off, and and we're not we're not seeing each other. And so people have gotten more and more lonely and more and more isolated. And I think for me, it's like, how do we break out of this isolation? You know, I did, I did a piece during COVID where I interviewed all these nurses and I spent hours listening to their stories. And, and then I put it together into this piece that we did and we performed, but the nurses were so grateful just to have an hour where somebody was listening to their story. Go invite a person who's cleaning your school and ask them to sit down and tell you their story. Go go invite somebody you've looked at every day and you have no idea who they are because you've never opened the door to being curious about who they are. And make that person real. We need to make each other real in our lives. So we're not these, you know, you know, cut off, estranged. Um, you know, Camus really talks about it, that in the state of estrangement that we're in you know, so much with each other lately. And um, I think I think you're so right about the missing. There And there are a lot of pe people missing right now. This is amazing. I deeply resonate with your mission and your, your beauty that you bring through every word that you say. I, I deeply resonate with what you do. So thank you so much. I feel very enriched. I feel full and glowing after our conversation. So thank you so much. It's beautiful. Like your energy is so beautiful. It's been such a pleasure. Mm, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yes, thank you. It's a great contribution to the summit. I think you spoke to so many important topics. So thank you very much. Thank you. Visit CollectiveTraumaSummit.com to listen to more talks like this one and to learn more. Thanks for listening to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website, pointofrelationpodcast.com, and by subscribing to the Thomas Hubel YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share about us with your community on social media. Thank you. We appreciate your support.